What's up everyone? Justin here. And this video is another uh, the year in wrestling video in my series talking about every year in professional wrestling up until 2015 I will talk about. I'm going to kick it off. This video is the year in wrestling 1992 part 1 I'll be talking about Royal Rumble 1992 Great Royal Rumble be talking about Wrestlemania 8 and WCW Super Brawl 92 uh, Super Brawl 2 in 1992 from my hometown of Milwaukee and a WCW uh, I'll talk a little bit about Clash of Champions that was from January I'm not going to talk about every match Talk about the Royal Rumble first because it was before Clash of the Champions 18. 18. So I'll talk about WWF Royal Rumble 1992 first. As I said, it was a great Royal Rumble. Very good pay per view. The uh, the matches that were not the Royal Rumble match were decent. Some were boring. Some were good. Where the hell is the page? I did it written down. Here it is Royal Rumble '92 from Albany, New York, took place January nineteenth, nineteen ninety-two. First match. On the pay-per-view was the new foundation, the team of Owen Hart and his brother-in-law, Jim the Anvil Nightheart, took on the team of the Orient Express. And the new foundation defeated the Orient Express in 17 minutes, 18 seconds, when Owen Hart pinned Pat Tanaka. New Foundation, Owen Hart, and Jim Neidhart would not last long as a tag team. I don't know what happened. Jim Neidhart disappeared from the WWF in 92. He went away. And at WrestleMania 8, Owen Hart was in a singles match. So that tag team was broken up. And then later on in 92, you had Owen Hart. In a tag team and be in a tag team with a new partner, Coco Beware. Uh, I forget their name, their tag name. I forget it. But they became a team. And Jim Neidhart uh, disappeared. I don't know why. Maybe he failed a drug test. I don't know. Up next, you had Rowdy, Rowdy Piper challenge the Mountie. For the Intercontinental Championship, the Mountie just won the IC title, I believe one or two nights before the Royal Rumble at Madison Square Garden at a house show. Bret Hart had a very high fever and was really sick, so I guess he decided to let the Mountie beat him for the IC title because Bret Hart was really, really sick. I don't even know why the company had Bret Hart wrestling. If he was really sick and had a really high fever, they shouldn't have had him wrestling. But maybe he wanted to really bad, so they let him. Anyways, the Mountie wins the IC title at a house show like one or two days before Royal Rumble 92. So Bret Hart loses the title. And he just gets it back. Like, two, three months later at WrestleMania 8. So the Mounties' IC title run was a joke. 
and he lost it to Rowdy Roddy Piper at Royal Rumble, 92. And that was the right decision. It was great, and it was awesome to finally see Rowdy Rowdy Piper in the WWF get some gold. That was his first and only title belt he ever won in the WWF. I take that back in 06 or 07. Uh, Rowdy Piper and Ric Flair actually won the World Tag Team titles. I believe at a Cyber Sunday pay-per-view. So Piper has held tag titles and won reign as an IC champ. So he held two titles in his WWF career. So Piper wins and wins the IC title from the Mountie. The crowd loved it. They popped and they just loved it. Up next was the Beverly Brothers taking on the Bushwhackers. Very boring, stupid, lame-ass match. The Beverly Brothers defeat the Bushwhackers, and nobody cared. Up next, another pretty boring match. Uh, wasn't the Road Warriors' fault. Wasn't the Legion of Doom's fault, because they were, they were good tag team wrestlers, and they could work. I'm not saying they were great wrestlers, but they were good at what they did. They were straight up power wrestlers, hard hitting wrestlers, stiff in the ring, but they got the job done. And people believed what the Legion of Doom did. They didn't have to do that much. All they had to do is uh, press slam people, power slam people, clothesline people, stuff like that. That's all they really needed to do. And they were over anyways. Even if they could never work a match. The Road Warriors had the look. And they were over forever with the crowd. So the Natural Disasters defeat the World Tag Team Champions. The Legion of Doom by Countout. A uh, dumb finish. But I understand it. Because the WWF did not want the Natural Disasters. To look weak and lose to the Road Warriors so they win by count out. The Royal Rumble match was epic. 1992 Royal Rumble still one of my favorite Royal Rumble matches in history. Why? Because you had guys, a lot of Hall of Famers in there. You had guys like uh, young Shawn Michaels in there as a heartbreak kid. Uh, when he first started his heel singles run, Shawn Michaels was in there. Uh, Hall of Famer Hacksaw Jim Duggan was in there. Hawk Hogan was in the Royal Rumble 92. Hall of Famer Ric Flair was in it. Hall of Famer Rowdy Piper was in it. Hall of Famer uh, Sid Justice was in there. He's not a Hall of Famer, but he should be. Sid was in there. The Undertaker, future, first ballad, Hall of Famer, was in there. Uh, Bret Hart, I think, or I'm, I think probably wrong. I don't think Bret Hart was in there. Um, who else? I named all the top guys. Uh, Randy Savage was in there. He's a Hall of Famer. Jake the Snake, he's a Hall of Famer. He was in there. So a lot of big, big names and Hall of Fame talent were in this Royal Rumble 1992. And it's one of my favorites of all time. It's probably in my top five favorite Royal Rumble matches of all time. And the finish was Hulk Hogan um, throughout got Sid out, eliminated Sid. Sid was holding on to Hulk Hogan's arm over the top rope. And he was holding on to Hogan's arm, distracting him. Ric Flair comes from behind, throws Sid. Not, not Sid. Ric Flair throws Hulk Hogan over the top rope while Sid was holding his arm. That set up WrestleMania 8 feud and match between Sid and Hulk Hogan. 
the Royal Rumble in 92 set that match up. And Ric Flair winning the championship set up his feud to defend it at WrestleMania 8 against Macho Man Randy Savage. And after Ric Flair wins the Royal Rumble 92. And the Royal Rumble 92 was 62 minutes and 2 seconds. And Ric Flair, I believe, was number 3. Either number 3 or number 2 in the 1992 Royal Rumble. So he lasted a really long time. He looked great in there. He looked like an Iron Man. And Flair could wrestle anybody back then. An hour, it didn't matter. He could be in the ring an hour, and he could probably go two more hours in the ring. He was that great. Uh, commentary for the Royal Rumble 92 was epic. It was tremendous. Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby the Brain Heenan were a great, great team. They worked super well together. They were entertaining. They were fun to listen to. They were both great. Uh, Bobby Heenan was funny as hell. Watch that Royal Rumble 92 back. You will be cracking up the entire match. When uh, Flair, when a, another wrestler even touched Ric Flair and started beating on him, Bobby Heenan started going nuts, started going crazy, and it was so funny. It was so funny. Uh, you had Bobby Heenan screaming, yelling, Saying, get your hands off Flair. And uh, putting down Rowdy Piper. Making jokes about Rowdy Piper. Calling him a skirt skirt wearing freak. And get away from Flair. And making fun of everybody that touched Ric Flair. And was trying to throw him over the top rope. And then you had the legendary comments that Bobby Heenan made. And kept saying... This is not fair to Flair. He was screaming it. This is not fair to Flair, Monsoon. It's not fair to Flair. And Gorilla Monsoon was great. He was yelling at Bobby Heenan, telling him to calm down and that he's sweating and just yelling at him, will you stop and saying stuff like that. The commentary was epic. One of the best commentaries ever that you're going to hear on a pay-per-view was at Royal Rumble 1992 in the Rumble match. And after Ric Flair won the title in the Royal Rumble, the title is up for grabs because of the controversial win that Hawk Hogan had defeating The Undertaker at Tuesday in Texas in December 91. So, the title's up for grabs. Ric Flair wins it in the Royal Rumble 92. After he wins it, he cuts a legendary great promo with Mean Gene. Mr. Perfect is behind him. And Bobby Heenan even shows up and is behind him also. And at the end, Bobby Heenan even says on the mic, let's all give him one big woo! And then all three of them do the woo! It was great. Great, great stuff. I love the Royal Rumble 92. And the Royal Rumble match in 92 made it, made the show great. The other matches I I could have gone without. All they needed was the Royal Rumble 92 Royal Rumble match on that show. And it was a winning, it was a 10. The show, the Rumble match in 92 was a 10. So, Flair is the new WWF champion. And before this Royal Rumble, you had uh, Flair and Hogan for the first time ever work against each other at house shows. They had a house show in Dayton, Ohio. And then they had two uh, matches at Madison Square Garden at a house show in December. I think it was December 91. And it may have been another one, may have been in November 91. So Hogan and Flair, that I'm aware of, that I saw, had two singles matches at Madison Square Garden in late 91. 
And they were good. They were decent. They weren't bad. They were entertaining. But the WWF, the company, or Vince McMahon, or the company, must have not liked how Flair and Hogan worked. And they must have not enjoyed the match. Because they did not work at WrestleMania 8. That was the money match. Everybody wanted to see Flair versus Hogan. It should have happened at WrestleMania 8. But it did not happen. Maybe it was for the better. Because Flair and Macho Man at WrestleMania 8 had a great match. And I'm sure that match would have been better than a Hogan versus Flair match. But I'm not saying WrestleMania 8 was a fail because it wasn't. But Flair versus Hogan would have been a great main event for that pay-per-view. But it did not happen. You can't we can't go to the past and change what happened. So WWF or Vince did not like Hogan and Flair's matches on the house show. So they were off for WrestleMania eight. Hogan versus Flair never happened. So that was Royal Rumble 92. Epic Rumble match. If you've never seen it. Or if you just want to enjoy it. And uh, make yourself smile. Listening to Bobby Heenan and Gorilla on commentary. Watch the Rumble 92 match. Up next. Uh, Clash of Champions 18. From... Topeka, Kansas. Happened on January 21st, 1992. I believe two days after Rumble 92. I'm not going to talk about every match. Because a lot of matches on the show were lame. I'll just talk about... They introduced... Uh, Jesse Ventura was introduced to the crowd at Clash of Champions 18... Jesse the Body Ventura came into WCW and basically debuted at Clash of Champions 18. He was on a ramp uh, with some WCW executives. And he got on the microphone and said he's here in WCW because it's the future of wrestling. And he's, he's, in, the, he's in the company that delivers the best wrestling and is the future. And then he, he even said WC, WCW has the future stars in wrestling. And that Jesse Ventura also said he is back in wrestling. And I uh, WCW did have a lot of great young talent in 92. They had Sting, Luger, the Steiners, uh, S Steve Austin, Rick Rude... A lot of great talent, but in 92, WCW was not better. I mean, the matches and the pay-per-views might have been better, but the WWF was still number one, in my opinion. In 92, they were still number one. Just look at SummerSlam 92 and the massive crowd that the WWF drew in Wembley Stadium. That shows you right there, WWF was number one still. In 92, uh, I don't, it wasn't that great of a year. I'm sure WWF made a lot of money, but it wasn't that, it was kind of a down year in the wrestling business, was 92. And WWF, in my opinion, from 92 and probably even 91, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95 were down years. They weren't that good at all. I mean, good stuff happened. A lot of good stuff happened. And we did see some good matches and good stuff happened. Like Bret Hart winning the world title and, and the King of the Ring in 93. And Owen Hart won the King of the Ring in 94. But business 
in my opinion, uh, stuff did not get great in the WWF until late into the summer of 96 after Stone Cold won the King of the Ring. And then the WWF was in a war with WCW into the summer and the fall. And WCW started kicking their fucking ass in uh, the fall of 96. Anyways, I'm talking about 92. Jesse Ventura debuts at Clash of Champions 18 in January. And then Sting comes out. Signs a contract to face Lex Lugert at Super Brawl 2. Uh, Sting signs a contract. He gets a massive pop. The crowd loves him. Now I'm going to talk about WCW Super Brawl 2. Super Brawl 2. Very soon after. About a month later. After the Clash of Champions 18. We get the first WCW pay-per-view of 1992. Happened February 29th from my hometown, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <clears throat> First match of the pay-per-view. You had Brian Pillman defeat Jushin Thunder Lager to win the light heavyweight championship of WCW. Pillman and Lager had an epic match. Lager and Pillman at Super Brawl 2, in my opinion, is one of the best and greatest WCW matches. Definitely in the top 5 or 10 greatest WCW matches of all time. They just tore the house down. They worked great together and they had a great match. And Brian Pillman becomes a light heavyweight champion. Or maybe Brian Pillman already was the lightweight champion and just retained. Uh, Jushin Lager, I guess. Jushin Lager was the light heavyweight champion and Brian Pillman beat him to win it. To win the title. Up next, you had Marcus Bagwell take on and beat Terrence Taylor. It was okay, but it was pretty. It was boring to me. Watching it back now, it was boring. Uh, up next, you had Ron Simmons take on Cactus Jack and defeat him. And then you had Junkyard Dog was in the crowd. JYD came out to the ring. Abdullah the Butcher was, I think, in the ring also. And JYD came in, interfered. I think it was after the match, or maybe it ended after Ron Simmons beat Cactus. JYD comes in, headbuds Abdullah, and beats up Cactus, and the crowd popped. They loved it. Up next, you had Heavy Metal, Van Hammer, and the Z-Man defeat Vinny Vegas and Rick, Ricky Morton. Vinny Vegas was Kevin Nash. Working another failed gimmick WCW gave him. But at least Vinny Vegas was better and more entertaining than Oz. Up next, Barry Windham and Dustin Rhodes. They were a great tag team together for a couple months. Defeated the team of stunning Steve Austin and Larry Zabisco. They were part of the Dangerous Alliance. Uh, World Tag Team Championship match. The champions Bobby Eaton and Arn Anderson, part of the Dangerous Alliance, defeated Rick and Scott Steiner by disqualification. That was a good tag match. U.S. Championship on the line. United States title. Rick Rude defeated Ricky the Dragon Steamboat in 20 minutes and 2 seconds after Paulie dangerously dressed up 
as Ricky Steamboat's ninja assistant smashed him in the head with his cell phone. So I, the ref did not see that. And then Rick Rude got the victory and got the pinfall. Dangerous Alliance. Rick Rude retains the U.S. title. And that was a great match. Before the interference, Ricky Steamboat and Rick Rude, they could wrestle with their eyes closed. They both, they always had great matches with each other. Main event, world champion Lex Luger. This was right before, after this show, I believe his contract ran out. And uh, he went to the WWF and appeared at, on WrestleMania 8 in an interview segment. And he was uh, hired to be part of the WBF. What is the WBF, you ask? It was shit. It was stupid as fuck. The WBF was was the World Bodybuilding Federation that uh, Vince McMahon started for some reason. He thought wrestling fans would pay to see uh, bodybuilders' polls. No, they wouldn't. And no, they will not ever. Wrestling fans will not ever pay to see bodybuilders posing all greased up with baby oil all over their bodies. No thank you, I don't want to see that. But Vince thought it was a good idea. WBF was not, not a good idea. It was a fucking stupid ass idea. Uh, XFL... I don't think XFL was that bad of an idea, but it did not work because you can't go against the NFL and beat them. The XFL ratings were not that bad, but I'll talk about that in my 2001 year in wrestling video. But XFL definitely was better than the WBF. That crap was shit. WBF was awful. Okay, Lex Luger defending the title. Of course, he jobs and Sting wins and becomes the WCW World Heavyweight Champion again. That was awesome. That was the right decision. And uh, Luger does the job for his friend Sting. They were, they are friends in real life. I think they're still friends. So Luger does the job to Sting because he knew he was leaving WCW and that was the right decision. So Sting becomes a two-time WCW World Heavyweight Champion at Super Brawl 2. Now I'm going to talk about WrestleMania 8 held in the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis, Indiana. The only WrestleMania that has ever been held in Indianapolis. WrestleMania 8 had a very large crowd. Uh, the attendance... No. I'll, I'll read the attendance in the next video. In part 2. Before WrestleMania that happened in April 5th, 92. I'm going to just talk about some news items from 92. Uh, February 8th, 92, Kerry Von Erich is arrested in Texas for attempting to get uh, drug prescriptions. Shortly after that, he is released from jail on $6,000 bond. And his father... Fritz Von Erich says that Kerry would be entering a drug rehab program after February 8th and after he's out of jail, I guess he went to rehab. Sadly, that did not work because I think in 92 or 93, Kerry Von Erich committed, he did commit suicide in 92 or 93. So he obviously still had his uh, addiction and his substance abuse problems. So the rehab did not work. Very sad. March 13th, Vince McMahon 
appears on Larry King Live to address the allegations of sexual misconduct and steroid abuse in the WWF. McMahon says the allegations of sexual misconduct misconduct are a bunch of bullshit or whatever he said. The allegations basically he said were not true on Larry King. March 16th, uh, very close to WrestleMania 8. Vince, the, not Vince McMahon, the WWF denies allegations of sexual misconduct within its organization and promises to conduct its own investigation into the charges. Uh, we do not believe the charges in these stories to be true. The statement says, in part, and we are so outraged that we have asked our authorities to determine what legal action might be appropriate. So the WWF was pissed over the sexual allegations, charges, and uh, Pat Patterson and Terry Garvin resign from their positions in the WWF on March 2nd because of the sexual misconduct leveled by former WWF employees and a wrestler, Barry Orton, and a, a former front office worker and two former ring attendants accused WWF and, I guess, Pat Patterson of sexual abuse. And, uh, if that's true, that is wrong, so wrong. And Pat Patterson, if that is true, Pat Patterson should no longer even be working still for the WWF. He is a legend in the business, uh, first Intercontinental Champion, but he should not be working there. If I gotta answer my phone, I will be back in a one or two minutes. I'm back. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize for I apologize for leaving, but I had to answer that phone call and talk to that person. It was very important. Back to these charges. I already talked about the allegations. I'm done with that. Back to WrestleMania eight. Now I'll be done with this part one of my video. 
it's already 34 minutes in and if you're still watching and you you sticked with this video when I left thank you very much I appreciate it a lot I just I had to answer my phone I didn't think the person was gonna call at this time but they did WrestleMania 8 the first match of the pay-per-view was Shawn Michaels with his new manager sensational Sherry uh, defeated Tito Santana and they had a good match to kick off WrestleMania 8 win 10 minutes 39 seconds up next you had Tatanka I don't think it was the second match but I'll just talk about the matches I've got down or the second segment or interview segment Legion of Doom D Legion of Doom came out and was interviewed on this stage by Mean Gene Oakland they should have been on Wrestlemania 8 I don't know why they did not have a match I guess the Legion of Doom did not have a match because the World Tag Team titles were defended between Money Incorporated and the Natural Disasters. That was stupid. And the Road Warriors, the Legion of Doom, LOD, should have been involved and had a match. At least had a match at WrestleMania 8. That was a mistake not putting them in a match for the fans to see them at WrestleMania 8 in action. A lot of mistakes were made. You had no Hogan versus Flair on WrestleMania 8, and you had no Legion of Doom in a match. Two big mistakes. Uh, Tatanka defeated Rick the Model Martel. The Natural Disasters challenged the World Tag Team Champions IRS and Ted DiBiase, and they won by countout. When uh, Ted DiBiase and IRS walked out of the ring and left. The team of Virgil, the big boss man, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, and Sergeant Slaughter defeated the team of the Repo Man, the Mountie, and the Nasty Boys. And that was a 10-man tag, or 8-man tag, and it only went 5 minutes, 22 seconds. Pretty pointless to put that on a WrestleMania. Up next, really good match. Uh, the second best match of the show. Randy Savage defeated Ric Flair to become the new WWF World Heavyweight Champion for the second time. Randy Savage becomes the WWF Champion. That was awesome and that was a great match to watch Flair bled in it and there was no bleeding a no ble bleeding policy in the WWF in 92 because they were kid friendly and uh, basically it was like a kids product in 92 it was but you had Flair bleed and he was told not to and Vince McMahon after the match was very upset at Ric Flair and yelled at him and said you don't we don't we don't do that here whatever I'm glad Flair did it it added to the match and it added to the feud between Randy Savage and Ric Flair having him bleed was good for the match I don't care what anybody says um so Macho Man becomes a world champ up next Bret Hart what challenged Rowdy Rowdy Piper for the Intercontinental Championship. This match was the best match on WrestleMania 8. It was the match of the night in uh, Savage and Flair. Yeah, Savage and Flair. I thought I was getting someone else mixed up. Savage and Flair was the second best match. So, Savage... I said that already. Savage won the title in B-Flair. Bret Hart bleeds also. Bled a lot. Uh, had a, his whole face was bloodied. F Bret Hart wins 
the Intercontinental Championship from Rowdy Rowdy Piper, and it was the best match on the show. Up next, you had The Undertaker in his second WrestleMania defeat Jake the Snake Roberts. Undertaker goes to 2 and old and starts his streak. But the streak continued even though Undertaker missed WrestleMania 10 and was not on the show because he disappeared because of what happened at the Royal Rumble 94. Anyways, Undertaker did miss Wrestle. Excuse me, I had to burp. <laughs> Undertaker missed WrestleMania 10 and WrestleMania 16, but his streak continued because he never lost until WrestleMania 30. Uh, so Taker defeats Jake Roberts. It was a very short match. Other matches, Owen Hart defeated Skinner. In 1 minute and 11 seconds. Our main event was Hawk Hogan. Versus Sid Justice. And this match was uh, believed to be Hawk Hogan's last match in the WWF. They did a big interview segment with him and Vince McMahon sitting down. Uh, all these pictures of great Hawkamania moments in the background. And what Hogan, Vince told him basically to his face. What Hawk Hogan and Hawkamania has meant to the WWF. And shook his hand and said thank you Hawk Hogan for the memories. And basically said that. And everybody thought this was Hogan's last match. Last Wrestlemania it was not. I'm glad it was not. Uh, I think he did want to retire in 92. Or he did want to uh, just do part time. Or just retire and be home with his family. His kids were really young at the time. But when Hogan was away and he was doing acting on Thunder in Paradise. And he was doing his acting jobs. Obviously, he really missed wrestling, and he told Jimmy Hardy he missed wrestling, and he would get an offer from Eric Bischoff, and he took it, and he went back to wrestling in 94 and went to WCW. So he missed wrestling, obviously. Obviously, everybody knows, and if you don't know, you're stupid, that uh, wrestling is obviously in Hulk Hogan's blood. He's addicted to the business like a lot of us are. And when I say us, I mean wrestling fans. A lot of us love the business and are addicted to it. So, Hawk Hogan defeats Sid Justice by disqualification when Harvey Whippleman, Sid's manager, interfered. And then Papo, Papa Shungo. Whatever, however the hell you say his name. Papa Shungo. Papa Shungo. Comes down to the ring with a giant skull with smoke coming out of it. Uh, that was pretty freaky. As a kid, Papa Shungo scared the hell out of me. Because I was a young kid. Anyways, Papa Shungo and Sid start beating on Hogan. And then the music hits of the Ultimate Warrior. The Ultimate Warrior is back in the WWF. He runs down to the ring. Does a sprint down to the ring. Gets in the ring. Uh, hits Sid or Papa Shunga with a few right hands. And clotheslines Sid over the top rope. Or he may be clotheslined Papa Shungo. I don't remember. But he clotheslined somebody over the top rope. And then Warrior was in the ring with Hogan. Uh, Ultimate Warrior looked a bit different. He had his hair cut short. And he looked much skinnier. And trim. It was not a different Warrior. There were, there were always rumors. I always heard rumors. And I actually believed them when I was a kid. That there were two Ultimate Warriors. There were never two. There was always one Ultimate Warrior. He just came back in 92 and was 
skinnier. It was the same guy that you saw in 88 and 89 and 90 and 91. It was the same Ultimate Warrior. He just had a different look and upgraded his look. So, Warriors in the ring with Hogan. Hawkamania music, Real American goes on, goes on and they celebrate in the ring. Uh, hug each other, hold each other's hands up, start posing. And WrestleMania 8 goes off the air. Pyro goes off in the background of Hogan and Warrior. And WrestleMania 8 goes off the air. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about the commentary on WrestleMania 8. was absolutely great, tremendous, epic, entertaining. Um, it was just awesome. Again, Bobby Heenan and Gorilla... Monsoon, my favorite commentators ever to listen to. My favorite team ever to hear on a wrestling pay-per-view. Or on any other shows they worked. They worked on a wrestling challenge for a lot of years. Commentary was great. You had Gorilla Monsoon telling Bobby Heenan, you want me to push you off the edge of this broadcast booth <laughs> There's a lo it's a long drop down and I'll throw you out of this window and uh, funny shit like that you had Bobby Heenan during Rowdy Piper versus Bret Hart uh, very in the beginning uh, Bobby Heenan asks and says to Gorilla Monsoon you know Gorilla I was a champion once and then Gorilla says of what? And then Bobby Heenan says, of the neighborhood. <laughs> that was funny as hell. Uh, you have then Bobby Heenan in the beginning when Reba McIntyre sang the national anthem or America the Beautiful, whatever she sang. I don't remember which one it was. She greets Tito Santana who came to ring that side. She greets him. And then uh, Bobby Heenan starts making a joke saying, Reba McIntyre just said to Tito Santana, or he started mixing her name up, and he says, that's, she's a Reba. Uh, Tito Santana said to Reba McIntyre, a Reba. Funny, funny jokes from Bobby Heenan, the entire WrestleMania 8 pay-per-view. So the commentary was epic again. It was just great. One of my favorite WrestleManias is WrestleMania 8. Just because of the commentary is that damn good on it. That's why it's one of my favorites. This was part one of the year in wrestling 1992. I went on a bit too long. I apologize. I did get a phone call during this video. Uh, thanks for watching. If you did, thank you very much. And if you follow me on Twitter, thank you very much also. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you if you talk to me on Twitter. Thank you very much. Uh, follow me at TNA WWE Guy. You know my other account. And if you don't, too bad. It starts with NXT. That's all I'll tell you. Follow me on Twitter. Hope you enjoyed this video. Part 1, 1992, The Year in Wrestling. Bye for now.